the brink of a uh, second disaster here. Well, uh, Jim Welsh is a researcher at MIT who has written and spoken extensively on nuclear threats. He joins me now from Watertown, Massachusetts. Maybe the coolant was delivered. Maybe it wasn't delivered. We don't know. But, Jim, help us understand this, because when we hear state of emergency declared, when we see an evacuation zone that is at first first established, then extended from three kilometers to ten kilo kilometers. Me on the outside, I'm looking and saying, this isn't good. What are you reading when you hear these? Hey, hear this. I agree with you, Mark. It's not good. Now, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. It doesn't mean it's the sen nightmare scenario. But if you evacuate people in a tsunami and you do it twice, you know, it does make you wonder. And, and here's the deal. Uh, and your early report, put your finger on it. Uh, the issue here is cooling. Uh, they shut down the reactor, but just because you shut down the reactor doesn't mean it's, it's suddenly uh, not going to be hot. If I have a pan in the oven, I turn off the oven, that pan is still hot and I'll burn myself if I touch it. And it has to be cooled, it has to stay cool in order not to uh, have a meltdown. And so the problem right now is they have no electricity. So they don't have electricity to, f to fuel the water pumps to pump water in to cool it. And now I'm told that they have uh, batteries and other electrical equipment on the ground, but they have not yet done that, and the clock is ticking, and we have another 24 hours or so where things are going to get dicey. I still think it's a low likelihood, but they are up against it right now. And, and so what happens in that process when we're talking about that 24 hours, you say they're up against it? I mean, what is happening as they, as, as they try to race that clock, and what happens at the end of the 24 hours if they don't beat the clock? Well, the deal is the temperature inside the reactor is increasing. And it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. The pressure is increasing. Uh, and as it gets hotter, uh, the, the concern is that the fuel uh, for the reactor will begin to melt. And, and then if it melts and somehow it escapes the reactor vessel and it touches the air, it will explode. And we've seen that with Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and other sorts of situations. That's your classic meltdown in popular parlance. But, you know, again, uh, there, there are some, there, you know, uh, this is one of the things that everyone worries about, so they try to prepare for it. So one line of defense is there is a containment vessel, just so that if this were to happen, it would contain uh, that problem within the six inches or whatever it is of concrete, so it would not escape to the atmosphere. Uh, but, you know, you, you, we have not run this experiment before, so uh, that's why there's concern. And that's why they're, let, they're venting some of the steam now, because one way to reduce the pressure and reduce the temperature is to let some of the air out of that. Even if it's mildly radioactive, that's better than the alternative. So uh, they're trying to manage the situation. Again, it, you know, it's more unlikely than likely that this is going to be uh, the thing that we all hope doesn't happen, but you cannot rule it out, sure. and that is naturally a concern. And, and, and Jim, you know, well, a lot's been said about how Japan is so well prepared, its engineering, its de design, its architecture. Does that also extend to its nuclear facilities that they are p perhaps better prepared for, for whether it's earthquake or tsunamis than you'd see in, in, in other parts of the world? Yeah, two, two, two important, ports of, uh, important points about that, Mark. One, you're absolutely right. They have earthquakes. They've had nuclear accidents before. They've had nuclear accidents where they didn't perform particularly well and where they were slow to release information and there were problems, and so they had to take corrective action, and normally that leads to a better system. But they've never faced an earthquake of this magnitude. The facilities that have been built have been built to be earthquake-proof, but not for an 8.9 earthquake. So that's point number one. Point number two is, you know, we're talking about a nuclear renaissance, that we're going to build a lot of reactors in the developing world. You know, Iran has an, its first new nuclear reactor. Other countries are going to have nuclear reactors. Well, a lot of these countries, Iran being one, are in earthquake zones. And I can guarantee you that Iran is n not nearly as well prepared to deal with an 8.9 earthquake as Japan is. So this is something that is not only a Japanese issue, it's an issue for the industry going forward as they plan to expand the number of plants they have, particularly in countries that that do not have all the protections that Japan has. And what, what other point, Jim, before I let you go here, we're, we're looking at these two plants that we're talking about now. How many plants are there? I'm not familiar with Japan's nuclear industry. I mean, are there many more plants in that area? Yes, uh, and Mark, this is the right question to ask. There are 55 nuclear power Well, at least we got the answer 55 out there, and uh, I guess we lost the bird. We must have reserved it right until 8.30, and we lost the bird, as we say in our 